audience. Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones here to answer your questions tonight. ABC radio announcer Sammy Shah. Jim Molan, the former Liberal senator, hoping to make a comeback. Rebecca Shark here from the Centre Alliance. Shadow Minister for Social Services and Indigenous Australians, Linda Burney. And marketing strategist Toby Ralph. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, we're hoping to get to quite a number of topics tonight, but our first question comes from Ross Kroger. Will the government set up an independent body to advise on deeming rates, New Start allowances and pension amounts? Or will only wealthy politicians have access to fair and equitable incomes? Rebecca well, Sharkey, sorry, we'll start with you. Now, you want to finish that question, yes. don't you? Go well, ahead. Pensioners freeze, go hungry, cannot afford access to health services and die. Rebecca Sharkey, start with you. This is uh, an issue that is very dear to my heart. Mayo is the oldest electorate by median age in South Australia. Uh, and an issue uh, and a cause that I've taken quite strongly to the parliament and will continue to do uh, for this term. Um, we do have pension poverty in Australia. We have 1.5 million uh, people who are existing entirely on the pension and around a third of those are in poverty. Um, last year, with uh, the former member friend I, uh, we, I backed uh, the call for an independent commission to set um, new... New start rates, youth allowance rates, uh, and the pension, and I'll be uh, taking that back into the yes, parliament. How has the government responded to that call? Because I, uh, they do like to keep their hands on these levers, don't they? Look, they do. But, but ultimately, <clears throat> every dollar that we can give to pensioners, um, it. It's helping them to live a good life. They spend every dollar back in the community. They're not buying online from overseas. They're supporting local businesses. They're keeping the heater on um, and they're buying food. And when I hear from people that are living in one room of their home, uh, they are not turning on the heater. They're going to bed at 6, 7 o'clock at night. Um, I don't think that's the Australia that we want to see and I think we can do much better. And I might say that I think both... Labor and the government have said that they wouldn't support an independent commission, but I think that that's the fair and proper thing to do. Jim Molan, uh, not in government at the moment. Maybe you will be sometime soon. We'll come to that later. Oh, but thanks, uh, but uh, you, might, you might like to give some gratuitous advice to the <laughs> government about what they should do about pension rates and well, you start. Uh, all I can say is bloody politicians, Tony. That's, <laughs> that's, uh, but uh, th th this is a very serious question. Uh, very, very serious question. And... The only organisation in Australia that takes an overall view of the entire nation is the government. Uh, every single part of the nation uh, wants more money, wants more, more goodness and, and, and wants more things for their particular part. The, the organisation in our country which spreads that money as evenly as possible and as fairly as possible across the nation is the government. So I, I find it very, very hard to make a, a decision and to give advice on individual things. For, for example, I believe that one of the most poorly served groups in our society are totally and permanently incapacitated veterans. Uh, uh, I, I think that of all the veteran community, they have the greatest claim uh, on, on resources. Uh, I, I think that kinship carers... Uh, uh, I, I am of an age where... I have a, a, a lot to do with people who are the, the fastest growing demographic in this country, which is, uh, which is people over 65. Uh, and uh, I, I have been made aware recently of the unfairness of grandparents who, for various reasons, find that the children of their children uh, have now come to be cared by them and in different states they are treated in vastly different ways and, and there's a real problem there. So, so Jim, I'll take you to the big one, New Start and base rate pensions. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're we going to have to wait until the economy tanks uh, before the stimulus of giving a rise to New Start and base rate pensioners <laughs> is necessary. Yes, and, and the stimulus is one of the reasons for doing it. Uh, in many of the country towns that I visit, People say to me, why are we paying people not to work? Now, 
uh, th th this is a very contentious view, uh, uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, only the government can see what priorities are across the entire community. All right, let's toss it across mm -hmm. to the other side of politics. Linda, sure. what do you think? Um, do you get people saying, why are people being paid not to work? Um, I have heard that, but let's be very clear and good evening, everyone. Let's remind ourselves we're on Wurundjeri country. <coughs> um, I have heard that, but I think it's really important that policymakers understand what the profile of someone on New Start is. It isn't necessarily a young person. It's often someone that's 55 or 60 that's been retrenched and probably has a very difficult uh, road ahead in terms of getting a job. So it's not just young people and that notion that somehow it is, is just not true. Uh, the second point that I'd make was Ross, was there? Um, thank you for your question. The second point about an independent body, I think you are right. I mean, politicians have an independent body to uh, determine what our salaries are. And Rebecca uh, is in, in part right. What I've said in terms of the Labor Party is that we're fairly agnostic on whether there should be an independent body that would set actually the deeming rate, on which I'm sure we're going to come to. I met with Ian Yates from COTA last week and I've spoken to a number of people in the, uh, in the uh, seniors groups. And their view is strongly is that there should be an independent body. And that is something that we'd obviously listen to. But let's be clear, the government has the reins, it has the mechanisms, it has the people to be able to set these rates. And that's what the minister said today. I'm not defending that for one moment. I'm just saying that there are two points of view. We are in opposition and our job is to listen to those points of view and come to a position over the next three years. Toby, what do you think? Um, your old boss, um, John Howard, a, a year ago called for an unfreezing of the new start rate. It had been frozen for too long. Um, that's the same from employer groups and business groups, but not the government at this stage. Sure. Um, a lot of people are calling for raises in new start um, and there are some pretty good cases for it. Um, Chris Richardson, I was interested to see from Deloitte Access Economics, was saying it would be great for the economy, along with a whole range of other people. To be honest, I don't actually know enough to whether it's a mm. good or a bad idea is the, is the truth. Lie. I can talk about deeming if you wish, Tony. Go ahead. So <laughs> That's part of the story. OK, so deeming, in my view, Ross, I think deeming is a terrific system because it saves a whole lot of bureaucracy and paperwork. The question is, what should the rates be? They've just been dropped to 1% if you're getting up to 52 grand to invest. And they assume you're making 3% if you've got more than 52 grand, basically because if you're investing more than 52 grand, you're likely not just to stick it in the bank, you'll have shares. And shares will give you on average about 4.5%, whereas a term deposit will probably give you two. So, you, so they assume you're earning 1% when you're probably earning two if you're in term deposits, and they assume you're earning three and you might be earning more than that. The, the, um, the rates were unfair. I personally believe the rates are actually pretty realistic now. I think, for me, the problem comes when a very conservative pensioner who can't afford to... who might have 100 grand, say, but is too scared to put it in the stock market because the stock market's too volatile, sticks it in uh, a term deposit, gets 2% and is taxed as, if, as though they're earning 3%. That's a problem. My, I think two things need to happen, um, and one of them is not an independent body. I think the first thing that we need Why to... Why not, by the way? Uh, I, I, well, I don't think that setting of the rate is, is a particular issue. I think the rates are fair. I, I think we need to treat people who put their money, irrespective of the quantum of it, into term deposits to keep it safe, should be taxed at the lower rate. Um, and I think we need to ask our financial institutions to develop special products which will cope with people who have more money, want to preserve their capital, want to earn 3% plus, and I think that should be a call on banks and financial institutions to deliver something mm. which will serve as pensioners OK, better. just briefly, uh, Lydia, you're shaking your head there, so I'll give you a 30-second uh, right uh, reply. The government has made millions and millions and millions of dollars off the backs of pensioners. Mm -hmm. They have not changed the deeming rate for four and a half years. It is not fair. And bringing it down 0.25% to 3%, I think, is not, um, not good enough. 
Let's go to the other side of the panel. Sammy, what do you reckon? Um, I'd start by not let, letting any financial institutions make be a part of the decision-making process, largely given their track record. Even here after the Royal Commission, we kind of know at this point the banks cannot be trusted with money, it turns out. Um, <laughs> uh, the, other, the other element of the, the deeming rates thing is, is look, it's, it is overdue. It is needed, clearly, and the RBA cut of 1% has kind of triggered this entire conversation. Great. Um, there are 75% of pensioners who do not benefit in any way and see no change in their lifestyles from a change in the deeming rate. Um, I think it's, if it's a first step and the next step is new start, and the other step after that is raising pension, that's great. But the fact that so far we've only seen this step being considered and no word at all about any of the other steps, um, for a government that's been... Is it, is it fair enough, do you think, for the government to actually wait and see how the economy is going and have one more lever they could pull to stimulate the economy? Um, I think something like uh, New Start, which is so overdue, more overdue, so many would argue, than the deeming rate issue ever was, um, should be a priority. And, and given the fact that the government's had a impression problem, obviously it didn't hurt them in the election, it turns out, but overall there is the top end of town kind of approach that most people accuse all the political parties of. Um, you'd think something like New Start would actually help them combat that impression and, and change the dialogue around who they benefit um, and who they're looking out for. Uh, it's a bit disappointing to see that they haven't had that level but of... But, uh, Sammy, the discussion. Prime Minister has ruled out changing New Start. So there we are. Yeah. At this time. At this point. OK, let's uh, move on. We've got another question. Um, we've got quite a few good questions tonight. We should get to as many as we can. This one's from Hayden Champion Silver. Hayden. Hey, guys. Um, so, I'm 21 years old. Last year, in November, I became homeless due to some um, traumatic experiences at home. And I come from the Melbourne's west side, so Melton to be specific. Um, when I did become homeless, I was... I had to move away from that area, approximately 40 kilometres away, um, when Hope Street Youth and Family Services found me um, crisis accommodation. <coughs> now, my question to you guys is, why are youth homelessness services not more available in growth corridors around Australia, despite these areas having some of the highest cases and highest rates of domestic violence and youth homelessness? Rebecca, start with you. Um, Thank you for your question, Hayden, and I'm very sorry that you have experienced homelessness. Um, and we know that young people are the largest group of homeless um, across Australia, and it's growing significantly. Before I was a Member of Parliament, I had the great privilege of working uh, in the youth sector, uh, and uh, we actually uh, were the base um, for services for young people who, who were... Um, um, seeking emergency services who were who were homeless, uh, as well as employment services and education services. Um, I, I agree with you. In, in South Australia, um, there is a, um, a, a central pooling and then um, the, there's different organisations that are responsible for different regions. I'm not sure what that is in Victoria, um, but I think that that, that that works quite well because we recognise that um, in regional areas, I mean, Mayo has a higher rate of, of homelessness um, than the national average. So in regional areas, um, young people are, are homeless. It's not just a, a metro thing. And there's an extra layer of isolation uh, if you are homeless in a regional area. So, Were you surprised to uh, see the new Minister for Homelessness um, say, oh, we need to put a positive spin on yeah. this hmm. yeah. uh, issue? It's really just a tiny, tiny percentage of the population. Um, so let's think about it in a more positive light. Well... I, look, I'll give Luke the benefit of the doubt, uh, and I'd be very Rookie happy. Error. I'd be very happy to sit down and chat with him about the experiences that, that I had. And what one of the the great um, um, tragedies is that in 2014 we had a rolling back of the NRAS, which was the National Rental Affordability Scheme. Now, for the organisation I worked for, that allowed us, when that scheme was around, which was a labour mm. pro program, it allowed us to go from um, having seven units um, to support young people in transitional housing uh, to support you with... Um, low income rent uh, and, and get you on your feet, because it's about getting people on their feet and then getting you into, into a job or back into education. Uh, and we were able to extend that during that time to 39. So we were able to help a lot more young people over a year. 
with the ending of that program, I think we're seeing a lack of building of social housing. That's and true. that was a great program to have. Um, and it wasn't... Um, government um, contributed a small amount, Jim, but not a lot. And it was really about getting the private sector and non-government organisations to, to be able to, to have some skin in the game. I'd love to see in this parliament um, uh, some more uh, funding, some kind of, you know, second version of NRAS, which would be something I'll certainly be lobbying um, Luke and, and other ministers. Um, but but I, I take your point in relation to um, uh, ensuring that there's services in regional areas and I'd be really happy to, to follow up and see what's in Victoria. Sammy, uh, Melbourne broadcaster, so mm -hmm. I'm going to give the next uh, answer to you. Go ahead. Um, honestly, the, uh, the amount of homelessness I saw in Melbourne when I first moved here took me aback. It's, uh, I came here 2015 uh, from WA, and, and we've been seeing a bit of an increase in homelessness over there, but the, uh, but the sheer numbers in, in the city of Melbourne, around this, in and around the CBD and the outer suburbs as well, um, was astonishing and quite depressing, given the fact that we're, we are a country that has had a growth economy for a longer period than most of the rest of the world. Um, record numbers, in fact, at one point. Uh, the, the new homelessness minister's statement was... It was one of those things where it shows you the disconnect he has from the problem, uh, given the fact that at one point he even said uh, that the amount of homelessness we've got is commensurate with the population increase, whereas that's not true at all. Um, the, pop the amount of homelessness has increased by 14% between the last two censuses. Population increase was 8.8%. So right there you can see that there is a crisis. Well, let, let's For quickly me, go... Let's, yeah. uh, I'll come back to you. Let's mm -hmm. just quickly go back to Hayden, our questioner. Hayden, <clears throat> you've, you've left home or forced to leave home because of a domestic violence situation, as I understand it. What would you say to a minister who says you've got to put a positive spin <laughs> on the issue? You can't. It's, there's nothing positive about being homeless. It's there's not a single thing I could think of when I was homeless that was positive. OK, Linda. It must have been terrifying, Hayden. Absolutely terrifying. It is hard to understand in a nation like this nation with the wealth that we have, that there is homelessness. Uh, a lot of it we can see, a lot of it we don't see. It's uh, young people sleeping on couches. And many of us have had experiences like yours. I had um, a homeless family with me for six months, good people, but uh, with three young children, just could not find somewhere affordable to live. Um, I think that, you know, that it really is the responsibility, as Rebecca said, of government, developers um, and uh, the business community and community housing providers to look at how you can leverage more funding to be able to build more units. We need more places for people to live and not just crisis accommodation. We need places... If you haven't got an address... You can't keep down, keep a job. It's hard to go to school. All the things that you're nodding to, and I know that you understand very, very much. Uh, Labor took to the election a second version of NRAS and 250,000 new housing units. We lost the election, but we would love the government to ha actually have a look at that and realise that this is one of the biggest social f social issues facing us. Just to finish up. Young people escaping domestic violence and women and children. Older women who are entering an age of their life where they should have comfort and they're homeless. And, of course, we have the issue of youth, as you're talking about. Uh, Toby, you've put a lot of uh, positive spin on some interesting issues in your career. Um, <laughs> homelessness, could you possibly do that? I think the jingle would be pretty hard. Um, the, to your point, Hayden... The, so, no. To your point, Hayden... Um, Melton is one of those areas which has quite a high degree of uh, ice usage. It's got some domestic violence out there, quite high domestic violence stats. Um, and, the, and, it's, and your question was, should we put resources out in, out in those places where the problems exist? I think that makes eminent good sense. I can't see why we wouldn't. Um, it's cheaper, it's better for people, it's probably a stronger long-term solution. So, yes, I agree with your proposition. Jim. The, the only comment that I'd make, Hayden, is that I, I certainly understand the issue. I've seen it uh, with people who are your age and not much older. Uh, uh, I've, I've certainly seen it amongst, the, uh, to mention them again, the veteran community 
and it's been a significant problem. A lot of that has been addressed Absolutely. by the RSL, mm -hmm. uh, by a non-government organisation, by people contributing uh, themselves to it. Uh, I, 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 I've seen it only in a little bit in, in the privileged city that I live near, which is Canberra. Uh, uh, I live in a rural area uh, and I'm sure it's there. It's just not as visible, I think, as Sammy was saying. Uh, but uh, it would be great to do something about it. Uh, again, uh, there is only so much to go across and that's New Start, pensions, homelessness and housing now we've got. Uh, it'd be great to throw money at them all. OK, we'll move on, and thanks for keeping us on our toes, Aidan. Uh, next question comes from Amanda Powell. Some people are saying that a constitutionally recognised Indigenous advisory body would be a third chamber of parliament. However, um, entrenching the power to establish a consultative and advisory body to parliament is certainly not a new idea. Um, and quite recently, in 2016, the Queensland Constitution Act entrenched the requirement to have parliamentary committees. Um, another example, New Zealand set up a parliamentary commissioner for the environment in 1986, and New Zealand's had a parliamentary Maori affairs committee since the late 19th century. So these bodies only ever have recommendatory powers. However, they can provide a voice, leadership and empowerment. What are people so afraid of? And are the claims of a third chamber of parliament just dog whistling? OK, Linda, we'll start with you. Uh, I am so pleased you've asked that question. Um, I want to say once and for all, and draw a line under it for the naysayers, a voice to the parliament is not, never has been perceived and it will not be a third chamber. It is a nonsense and it's mischievous to even describe it as that, as you've realised. Uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and I'm sure most people here uh, know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Uluru Statement from the Heart, talked about three things. It talked about a voice to the parliament enshrined in the constitution so no government could get rid of it. It talked about a Makarata Commission that would lead the process of treaty or agreement making, many of them already existing in Australia, like the Noongar Agreement in Western Australia in Perth. And the third thing it asked for was a national process of truth telling for all of us in this nation to come to terms with our past and be comfortable with it. And I think that that would grow us up remarkably as a nation. Labor has said to the government, we will work closely with you. Uh, Rebecca and I have spoken about it. We will work closely together. There is a long way to go with this discussion. And I believe that having an Indigenous voice to the parliament would be beneficial to everyone, but most beneficial to issues like Hayden's race and others. That's the social justice outcomes for First Nations people, which are frankly um, atrocious. OK. Uh, <coughs> thank you. A couple of quick questions. Um, Ken Wyatt seems to be moving towards a legislated model, not a model built into the Constitution. Is that a compromise? that you might be prepared to make. I know that the voice, um, as part of the Uluru Statement, is meant to be in the Constitution, but the pressure will be for it to be outside the Constitution. That's coming from Peter Dutton, among others. The Prime Minister seems to agree. Um, if this is too hard, a, uh, a rock to push uphill, will you compromise and have it outside the Constitution? Oh, well, th three things, Tony. Um, at the moment, I am not talking about and the Labor Party is not talking about compromise. But we are talking about working as collaboratively as possible with the government um, and who knows where we'll end up in a few, uh, in a year or two's time. <coughs> the most important thing is to hear from the voice of First Nations people and I know uh, very much from my own discussions and consultations that people want a voice to the parliament that has surety. We are still very burnt by the experience of ATSIC, which was gotten rid of by, um, I think it was John Howard and Amanda Vanstone was the minister. 
So what First Nations people, everyone, are looking for is a voice that cannot be at the whim of a government, which is why the Constitution is seen as an instrument for making that voice permanent. Um, we will have the discussions, uh, work through the issues, and I can assure you uh, that this is not a scary prospect. This is something that is well overdue and could well change some of those issues that we've been facing as a nation for so long, like homelessness, like uh, domestic violence, like incarceration, child removal, and shocking, shocking um, life expectancy outcomes. OK, let's throw this around the table. Toby, what do you think? Um... I think this is an evolving conversation. I think it's a very important one for Australia. I'm, in my work, I'm lucky enough to work with a lot of people who run big things, corporations, even countries, uh, industries and so on. And some are good leaders, some are bad. What, what I notice is a characteristic of a good leader is not that they have brilliant strategy or they're forceful or they're economical or their tactics are wonderful. A great leader has the capacity to carry people mm. with them and take one step, get as many people as possible to take one step in the same direction. That's a very hard thing to do in this circumstance. Is that, I, are you looking for that from I, the Prime Minister? No, I'm looking for that from Ken Wyatt and I think he's doing a superb job of it. Mm. I think if he put a specific recommendation, it could get shot down now. I think it's unsurprising that in raising what's done, some people, are, some people have very high expectations of, of the great news that might come from it and others are scared of it. I think that's all just part of a conversation that will evolve and I congratulate Ken Wyatt for what he's doing. Uh, Jim, um, can I just take you to a point here? The um, Republican referendum sort of founded uh, when people wanted to vote for a president. Now, some people said even if the president had no specific powers, he'd have a symbolic power over Parliament and the Conservatives did not want to see a body with a symbolic power. It seems the same argument is being played yes. out around the voice. Uh, I think if it becomes a symbolic activity, you'd have to ask yourself why you would do it. Uh, I, I'm not scared of the issue, uh, but, but I, uh, as a principle, I uh, would be very unwilling to place this in the Constitution. And as a, as a Liberal Conservative, uh, I think that the, 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 the challenges that Linda has just explained to us, uh, that the Indigenous population, the Indigenous uh, 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 group in this country face, I can't see how they are related to the Constitution. And if we, if we take all those individual things that, uh, that Linda was talking about and hope to solve them by doing something in the Constitution, I think we're moving away from the main activities, which is to, to uh, uh, change, to, to, to assist our Indigenous people to uh, bring themselves up to where they want to be. What would be the problem of putting an advisory body <laughs> into the Constitution if it didn't have the power to impact legislation but only to advise on it? Well, why put it into the Constitution? Uh, I mean... Uh, so, Linda, well, Linda, Linda, Linda just said, made the argument so it can't be at the whim of a government. Well, yeah, but it. there were other reasons why ATSIC went down. Let's face it, let's be truthful about it. It wasn't just John Howard trying to do something wrong. There are many other reasons why ATSIC went down. But I just... Uh, I find it very, very interesting that having taken racial references out of the Constitution, we're now going to put them back in. And if we are... But if, they're if our, in there now. Uh, well, why do you want to put them in then? They're already in there. Well, why do you want to put more in? <coughs> well, the question is, you're not going to solve homelessness. You're not going to solve uh, all those problems you went through by having something in the Constitution. And, I, you know, I, I visited the Northern Territory recently on a stillbirth inquiry with Mullandiri McCarthy. Uh, she's a superb spokesperson for her people. A superb spokesperson. You're a superb spokesperson for your people. Why is that, uh, uh, the Chinese community, the, the, the uh, uh, more recent migrant community, they, they, why don't they have a, a, a body which advises the parliament? We all have our members of parliament. I'm, I was a senator. Okay. He wasn't seated, mate. I was a senator. So we'll, we'll just get a microphone over to you so you can actually make that point and the audience can hear it. <coughs> OK, sorry. You, Levi. In the second row. Levi. <laughs> Thank you. So you, I, I didn't hear what you said because... Yeah, so let's be really clear. Since 1778, sovereignty hasn't been ceded by any of the First Nations of this country. 
And the only way that sovereignty has been pushed aside is through force and violence. Thank you. We'll take that as a comment. Rebecca, um, going back to the question of the voice. So, I think that as a nation we have a huge opportunity here. And uh, I think if, if anyone was to lead this on the government side, I think Ken White will do this. I have um, tremendous respect for Ken. Uh, it needs to have the whole of the parliament uh, behind uh, uh, this, this decision. And, and I think, um, Jim, it's about recognition. And, and it's, it, we need to ensure that in our constitution, we recognise that this land um, has been the land of Aboriginal people for 60,000 years. Put it in the preamble. Well, can I, can I ask, would you, would you be happy to take out uh, uh, the religious protection out of the constitution? No. No. Well, <laughs> there you go. Look, mm. um, look, I think that um, it's a journey uh, and I think that what will be really important is that we get this right because I think that uh, the parliament, uh, I think that history, uh, European history, has let down Aboriginal people and we can't, we can't let down Aboriginal uh, people and this Tony, time. Yes, and it needs to be yeah. um, us not the parliament not doing things to Aboriginal people. It needs Weird. to be all of us together walking side by side. I, I'm, I'm excited about this. I think, um, I think uh, Ken, Ken White is a, is a tremendous member of parliament uh, and I think that he will, he will take this forward. I will say one thing though. When Malcolm Turnbull was the Prime Minister, towards the end of his time, I actually uh, stood and, and asked a question. The crossbenchers get one question a day. Uh, we actually now get a second one at the very, very end, but you never know <laughs> if you're going to get to that. Um, and I asked him, there are four flags that fly uh, in the House of Representatives chamber and all four of those flags are the Australian flag. Uh, and there is an Aboriginal man in my community, um, shout out to Headley, and he said, I don't feel that I am recognised uh, in the chamber. I would like to think that we could, um, at the beginning of, of this parliament, we're very new in the parliament, uh, to have um, both the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait Islander and the Australian flag all fly proudly in our chamber. Okay, we've got another question on this and it's from a different perspective. Uh, it's from Bill Thompson. Bill. After working and paying taxes for about 50 years myself, I believe that no person living in Australia today should be entitled to any special benefit or recognition which is based not simply on need or achievement but rather on race or how long their ancestors were here. What do the panel think about that? I'm going to start with uh, Sammy because we haven't heard from you on this issue. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the easy one. Um, <coughs> It's, it, look, it's easy to dismiss the value of race um, when it's not something that has been a defining aspect of your life, when it's not something that has been used to vilify, deprive, um, and, and rather, in many cases, destroy entire communities. Uh, in, in, in situations like that, when, we, when you don't have that experience, when you've never had that, um, that, that kind of vilification coming at you based entirely on your race, it's easy to sit and say, look, you know what, it's a fair go, everyone's born equal, everyone dies equal, and, and I don't see race. Um, it's actually harder to see race in these situations because that acknowledges a certain level of privilege. I can understand why you'd feel that, look, um, you know what, there's no race, everyone's equal, I don't, why should my taxpayer money go in different areas? Uh, but unfortunately for you, we do live in a society which is entirely designed upon helping one another helping the underprivileged. We have New Start, which we desperately need to increase for a reason. We have Centrelink, we have all of these things. We have you know, Medicare, we have a system designed to help those who need the help. And there is, whether you like that truth or not, a community within Australia who, because of their race, have suffered more and greater than any other community in this country. And to give them the help because their race has put them in a situation where they've needed the help, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Bill, if you want to come back, that's fine. Linda. Um, I'm rather surprised by your comment, Bill, and I, um, I'm a little saddened by it, actually. Uh, I've paid my taxes for 50 years too, um, 45 years, I should say. Uh, I think that where you're coming from uh, is not actually understanding the truth of this nation. Um, and the truth is uh, that First Nations people um, have a special relationship with the land. 
um, and have a very spiritual uh, relationship with country that has gone back tens of thousands of generations. And that means something. Uh, the second point that I'd make is that um, if you think that uh, bigotry and racism has not been part of the Australian story, um, as Sami has indicated, then you're wrong, <coughs> because it has. And the thing that I see daily are the terrible outcomes of that bigotry and that racism and that history. I see it in young people, young Aboriginal people in particular. Uh, and it is uh, also, I think, a really important point to make, and I'll finish on this, Tony, is that the truth uh, liberates. And for us as a nation to come together as Australians, all of us, to understand our shared history, our shared, um, our shared story, can only make us a better place. Just, just a quick one, Linda. Hey, wait, we know what happens with referendums. So few of them get passed in this That's country. True. And uh, the leadership... Uh, to take you there it needs to be bipartisan, it needs to be consistent and yes. it needs to make a clear point to the electorate which is led from the top. Do you think you're going to see that happen uh, under this government? I desperately hope so. Uh, we um, in the Labor Party have completely embraced the statement from Uluru, the statement from the heart, uh, completely embraced it and have done so, done so for some time. I think... Uh, you've heard our leader, Anthony Albanese, say that. Here's, he... here's the problem, though. Ken Wyatt, um, who could be the leader on the government side of this debate, has not embraced the whole thing but only part of it. Yeah, well... um, and he's now separating out the voice from the Constitution, it seems to yes. be. Yes. And I think the position of the Prime Minister is fairly clear, uh, that he would like to see recognition of First Peoples in the Constitution, um, not the preamble... Um, but the Constitution, and would like to see a voice legislated. Um, that is where the position of the government is at the moment. The position of the Labor Party is a full embrace of Uluru. But we also are very understanding that for a successful referendum in Australia, it must be bipartisan, it must be across the parliament, I would say, to Rebecca. Now, that is, the, uh, del that is the, the situation there is. There is a long way to go with this discussion and I'm not going to preempt anything at this stage except to say this, that at the end of the day, there has to be a permanent voice to the parliament that advises the parliament on issues pertaining to First Nations people, be it legislation or policy. And that can only make the outcomes better um, my wish is that it be enshrined within the Constitution. The government has a different position and we will see where we get to. Um, and I, I hope that Scott Morrison can come to this discussion with an open heart and an open mind. OK, well, a uh, long way to go on that debate, we think. The next question comes from David Cartney. Sami so, Shah, as a writer and comedian... Do you modify how far you push the boundaries of freedom and of speech to suit a particular audience that's in front of you? <laughs> um, I, look, I, I do perform differently, obviously, to the different audiences I perform to. Uh, so if I'm performing in a comedy club, for example, uh, there'll be a lot more profanity and, and <laughs> descriptions of genitalia <gasps> than, um, than there would be right now, for example. Oh, um, for, I think for everyone's sake. Um, I, and, I, and I also host <laughs> Breakfast Radio, and that's a different job huh? entirely. And I, when I write a book, it's a different thing. Um, your audience does define the message to some degree. But if you aren't being honest in your message, your audience will always walk away from you. So, are, are there order, I've got to ask you this uh, as an ABC uh, yeah. broadcaster myself. Are there automatic limits to your free speech by virtue of you being an ABC broadcaster? <laughs> um, other than the stuff that you kind of have to sign on to, which is you can no longer curse on your social media, um, which I miss terribly, um, and, and, uh, and, and biases. You, you should not display biases. I th and I think that's an important one because given the fact that I do also consider what, you know, what I do as journalism, um, having a bias would make me poorer at my job. Yeah. Um, 
So as long as, I, as long as I maintain those two, I feel like that's a reasonable request from the ABC, and I've al always believed they're important things anyway. But beyond that, um, yeah, when I'm, you know, if I'm at a comedy club or if I'm doing anything outside mm. of here, uh, it is a different voice, but it's also because that's a different demand from the okay, audience. Okay, you did a study of free speech, a five-part podcast called Shut Up. I'll give you an advertisement for it. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> what did you discover about the limits of free speech, the <coughs> borders of free speech in this country. In it Australia. obviously changes from country to country. And yes, very much in Pakistan so. and the, the borders there are mm. much tighter, I imagine. Well, one of the interesting things I discovered was the fact that the borders change constantly. Um, what we think are the borders now um, were very different even 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And there are certain things which every country considers blasphemous within their own belief system. Uh, so within, you know, in Pakistan, for example, it was religion. Uh, with, you know, any criti criticisms of that were blasphemy. But in Australia, for example, you can argue that any discussion or, or criticisms, rather, of the Anzacs would be considered fairly blasphemous. Um, and that's definitely one border that we as a country have defined as, you know, you don't transgress that or else there will be mm. consequences. The Yasmin effect. The Yasmin effect and, <laughs> and, and uh, Scott, who worked for SBS uh, for a while as well. Uh, so we've seen that. Uh, beyond that, though, it, it's always shifting. There was a period of time when Lady Chatter Chatterley's lover was banned in Australia because it was considered just too darn saucy for this country. <laughs> and now you wouldn't blink if someone mentioned that to you, and now there's other you know, la rules and regulations. So we decided collectively what, what we're okay with and what we're not okay with. Um, and I think actually you know, one side is going political correctness gone mad, and the other side says we're not you know, being free enough. Um, I think I, that's a good thing, because when you have the, those two sides fighting, you f you're constantly redefining the boundaries, and that's a healthy debate to be having. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot about free speech on this program, so I thought I'd just hear from you on that one, and mm -hmm. we'll uh, go to another question. We'll hear from another individual on the panel. It's from Emily Foley. Um, my question's for Jim Mullen. Uh, so you polled 137,325 first preference votes in the 2019 federal election, making you the politician with the highest personal vote in the country following a campaign urging people to vote below the line. Yet you failed to secure a Senate spot after the New South Wales Liberal Party placed you in an unwinnable fourth position on ballot papers. Does this demonstrate that factional politics will always disadvantage the interests of the people that politicians are elected to serve? <laughs> that was a pretty fair summary of your uh, recent political Well, well uh, I'd like this to be fact-checked, please. <laughs> but, uh, thank you for the question. That was, that's a tremendous uh, question, Emily. And, and, Just what uh, I if, wanted. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you think I'm going to get back into factional politics, you start raising mad in New South Wales. I'm safe down here in Victoria because no-one in New South Wales watches this. Show. Well, you're lucky. <laughs> you're lucky. You're not on a national program. <laughs> but, but I'm not on a. What, what I would say, though, and what needs to be fact-checked, is that my understanding of 137,000 votes is that it's not just in that election; it's the largest number of first preference votes that any po any individual politician has got in uh, at state and federal level in the history of Australian politics. And when you make that argument to the Prime Minister. <laughs> In relation to the casual vacancy yes. which will soon appear as a result of Arthur Sinodinus going to Washington. Well, what has he said to you? You're so <laughs> popular, Jim, I want you back. <laughs> I have not made any argument to the Prime Minister and I would not make that argument to the Prime Minister because I don't believe that I, have, uh, I should ever work on an entitlement. If 137,000 people thought that uh, they would vote for me, which is an extraordinary number. I was never, you know, I, I would have loved to have gotten 600,000 votes. Uh, uh, I will run for the pre selection and uh, I will leave it up to the pre selectors, which is the way it should work, uh, and I will run on the basis of merit. So, um, and when you're speaking of the pre-selectors, um, mm. right, no doubt you'll tell them that you're the most popular politician in history. Um, <laughs> but what else will you say to them? Because uh, you were a senator, mm. um, you were a prominent figure uh, briefly while you were a senator in, in your part of the parliament, in your faction, if I can put it that way. Um, will you be arguing that you need to go back into that role? No, I will argue that, that uh, uh, on the basis of merit... Uh, is one thing, and I, uh, I have uh, a, 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 a record of merit that I think should be looked at, and, and that's an argument that I've got to make. But I will make an argument on the basis that I am a Liberal Conservative, that we need 
uh, a range of views within our parliament, not just... Uh, uh, we need a range of views of all different areas, not just in the parliament, but also in our party. This is a job interview. Uh, <laughs> and that my being there on a routine basis would contribute to that. I also have one significant issue of unfinished business, and that is uh, I, I, I will propose, if I get back in, I will propose and encourage government to adopt a national security strategy. Uh, a, national, a national security strategy is an essential component of the fact that uh, the strategic environment of our world uh, has changed considerably as, and has never been more uncertain since the end of the Second World War. And I'm not asking government to spend one cent more on defence, but what I'm saying... Is my is... country needs me. No, what I'm saying... Don't be facetious, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is that there are very important issues across not just defence, but across uh, energy, liquid fuels, food resilience, water resilience, a number of different areas that need to be addressed which are not being addressed. Therefore... I'm your man. A final uh, quick one. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like a job interview. <laughs> it did sound like it's you were talking to you. It sounded a little bit like you were talking to the pre-selectors there, but yeah. amongst those pre-selectors were yeah. people that think you betrayed the party oh. by running your below-the-line campaign. Um, those people will not want to see you get back. What's your argument to them? Uh, no, they won't, and uh, I may not be able to convince them, uh, but the pre-selectors uh, will decide the issue finally and uh, let's see what they say. Prime Minister has uh, quite a sway in these matters, doesn't he? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I guess he has an influence. Uh, I don't think he will get. Uh, I don't think he will get involved intimately in it. But uh, you never know. You never know your luck on a good day. <laughs> but uh, what, what I would say, though, is that one of the most important things that, regardless of what people think I did during the uh, the, the election, the below the line campaign, uh, I was also 2016. After I was put in exactly the same position in 2016. I was part leader of the democratic reform movement in the New South Wales Division of the Liberal Party, which delivered uh, what most other parties have already got, that is plebiscites okay. and, and democracy at the lower right, level. This ad was brought to you by Jim Moore. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you asked uh, me. Well, you, asked you me. did get the question. <laughs> uh, remember, if you're here, I don't know if you're a dear friend of his. We should Thank you very much. That, I dare say. <laughs> uh, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims tonight, please let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question comes from Elena Dal Pio Lojo. Toby. It has been reported that you believe that lies, inaccurate simplifications, bribery, deception and downright misrepresentation have always plagued politics. You also stated in the past that in politics it's all about the result. To come second is to lose, so every effort is made to win. From your experience helping politicians campaigning, in multiple elections, both in Australia and overseas, what is the best way to deal with the trade-off re between representing the public the truth and making the politician win the election at all costs? Tony, thank, thank you for the question. The trade-off from my perspective, I assume you mean? Mm. Um, I view myself as um, a propagandist. And my job is to make the best and most persuasive case possible. Um, and uh, I will do that for all manner of people. Politicians, unacceptable industries, human rights groups, you name it. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a cab for hire and I'll take you where you want me to take you. On the other side... You'd be a bit careful about that because quite a few people around Donald Trump had that philosophy. <laughs> On the other side, there are, there are equivalents to me. And they are... Every bit, as, every bit as skilled. I think what that leads to is duplicitous but um, robust debate. My hope and my, my belief is actually that Australians are actually smart enough to sort through the nonsense that we produce and make a balanced decision at the end of the day. If you look at the last election, for example, there were um, misrepresentations on both sides. You had um, allegations of death duties, um, which, which bubbled up, which were patently false. The franking credit situation was patently misrepresented. You know, you get a bit of it from both. Were that a... Were that a corporation? Were these people directors in a corporation? They could be locked up. 
you know, they'd be, they'd be done under the misleading and deceptive uh, Trade Practices Act. They, so, so how do we... Uh, but when you take those... When you take misrepresent, political misrepresentation in an election to court, the judges tend to dismiss it as the argy-bargy of politics. So what do you do? You fight as hard for the side that uh, you're fighting for and someone does the same on the other and somewhere in the middle I hope you can see s some common sense. Is it possible to have integrity and at the same time have a win-at-all-costs ethos in politics? I haven't seen it mm. uh, in, in, in my role, no. Linda. Yes. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've only just met Toby tonight. <laughs> Um, and now you're going to hire him? No, <laughs> I am not. Just the Labor Party. Um, I, I can only speak from my personal perspective, Tony, and that is that um, the reason I've gone into politics I'm very clear about. Uh, the three motiv motivating factors was my Aboriginality, the fact that I'm a woman and I've worked all my life in the area of social justice. I take very ser seriously my job as a representative. I remind myself every day just how important that is and the fact that people put their, their hopes, their aspirations, their hurts, their loves in you and expect you to uphold those within the parliament. I'm a member of, a, uh, of the Labor Party and therefore I have an enormous commitment to my party um, and a responsibility there have a responsibility to the people that elected me and I have a responsibility to the broader community and in particular, in my case, the Aboriginal community. Rebecca, what do you think, and what do you think generally about the philosophy that was espoused in the question you heard Toby talking about it in more detail? Well, my belief is that we need to get money out of politics because if we do that, the major parties can't afford the hard <laughs> guns. Um, and, and I'd like to see us have a system where you know, as a first instance, we have real-time political donations because any of the donations made um, uh, during the last election, you won't even be able to see um, what they are until next February, and that's only for donations that are above the threshold of, of just around thirteen thousand mm. dollars. Um, Politics has become um, a big money industry. Uh, and the other side of it, of course, is advertising, which absolutely. saw the biggest advertising and the, and plunge in the last election exactly, of any election. Exactly. With, with um, Clive Palmer in particular, which didn't pay off for him. Um, depends as far what his as, aim it was. Depends really. what his aim yeah, was um, right. as far as seats. Um, but when you're a member of the crossbench, when you're from a minor party like I am, you, we, we just don't have any of the funds. And what's interesting is any motions that we've taken to the parliament um, that looks at curtailing um, money out of politics, um, you find that both the major parties stick together mm -hmm. on them. Uh, and, and I think that we will only... Um, see true change and actually a, tra a change in culture around elections. I mean, between the robo-debts, uh, robo-calls, sorry, um, between, you know, in, in my electorate, people were getting glossy shoved in their mailbox every day, um, saying that pretty much a vote for, for Rebecca Sharkey was going to end your world as you know it, and somehow um, Bill Shorten was going to be in Mayo every day of the year. Um, it, was, it was really actually bordering on, on offensive, particularly when we then started to get, um, uh, we got a, a letter written in cursive from an 83-year-old lady, and I'm sure this lady uh, had no idea that that would then be um, dropped mm. into every letterbox across the electorate saying, uh, saying that I would be um, uh, ensuring that their franking credits um, uh, were lost. And so in no. order for us to get to truth in political advertising, um, I think we're going to need to get rid of money first. Sammy. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I worked in advertising b before I became a journalist, so I kind of have uh, Toby's understanding of how um, repulsive an industry it is. Um, <laughs> and, 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 it, and it makes sense that, that advertising and politics kind of have blended together, uh, like attracts like. Um, one, of the, one of the worst election systems in the world, it's a great spectator sport, but it's a horrific thing to be a part of, no doubt, is the American system. And that's mm -hmm. entirely because the money in politics over there the amount of advertising spend, the amount of donations and untracked donations and all of that. Mm. And, and this was the closest we've come to that. And the Supreme Court decision that money is speech. Exactly. And, and, and that mm. in and of itself is, is such a questionable statement. But this election was the closest we've come yet to an American-style election. It's still a long way away from there. But 
I, I do feel like it's worryingly close at the same yes. time. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather pull back away from mm -hmm. it by, as mm -hmm. Rebecca said, taking the money out of the politics, yeah. out of the elections. Um, but it is disappointing that when the question always comes up, Labour and Liberal do join forces and, uh, and all the minor parties are left out to dry. OK, we're going to try and get to our last two questions. The first of those is from Lucas Moon. Yeah, as a veteran myself, there's a group of us younger veterans would like to see the RSL get right out of the pokies business and instead focus on welfare and advocacy issues that are set up to do, particularly the disturbing high rates of suicide amongst my generation of veterans. Is it OK for Australians to be the world's biggest gamblers per capita in terms of $24 billion a year in losses? And is it OK for more than $1 billion of these losses to incur inside RSL-branded poker machines? Jim, why won't the Liberal Party tackle the issue when ve veterans suffer above average rates of gambling harm and suicides released last week by the Productivity Commission, double for under 30. And, Jim, that's what we know of because you don't know how many veterans we have. Jim. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Thank you. <laughs> this, is, this is a much bigger issue down here in Victoria than it is in New South Wales, and, and I've been following it from the side, uh, the complaints about the RSL down here. I'll, I'll leave that to one side. I think we as a society do take our veterans seriously to the tune of $11 billion. Uh, the, that's the amount of money that we put into, into our, our veterans each year from DVA. Now, Jim, I'm not going to let you leave the question aside because the core of that question mm. was about the RSL and pokies. Yeah. And it's a pretty straight question for you. Yeah, I, I, can't, I, I can't... I'm not going to get mixed up in... Uh, I've spent a lot of time working with the RSL in New South Wales on their issues. I can't, Tony, get involved in this. I've watched it from the side. Uh, if there is a, a, the, the greatest provider of support to veterans has been RSL sub-branches. That's where the strength of the RSL lies. Sometimes they've been very badly let down by their leadership. And certainly they were at a stage in New South Wales. Uh, and the, but the, the, the beauty of the RSL is in its sub-branches. Yeah. If it gets confused by pokies, that's a really sad thing. Well, it is confused by pokies, according to our question. You've got your hand up. Go ahead. Uh, Jim, just want to rephrase it. At the start of the night, you, you said uh, veterans that uh, were permanently incapacitated yep. um, deserved a lot. Well, the legislation obviously changed in 03. So today's veterans get a lump sum payment from DVA most times. And I'm aware of many veterans and double amputees and those with brain injuries, that same organisation that helped them, being the RSL, they've gone and put all that money in the machines and now they live off a $22 a fortnight pension. Um, yeah. is, is that still OK for you as an ex-general? No, not of course it's not. Of, of course it's not. But there's, there's no way in the world that any organisation can reach out and touch every individual. You, change, you join the RSL, fight for the RSL in your state and change the RSL, as some fantastic people in this state are trying to do, and I watch it going on every day. If there is something wrong down here, uh, 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 it's, it, the federal government can't do much about it, uh, but they can do an extraordinary amount about supporting veterans, and they do do a lot about supporting veterans. OK, let's hear from other panellists. Sammy. We've, uh, we've actually... Hi, Lucas. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to finally see you. We've had Lucas on our radio show on ABC Breakfast uh, over here in Melbourne, and we've had this issue going on for a while as well. And what it came down to, we discovered, was a generational fight. Um, the mm. previous generation just had a different relationship to the pokies and the current ones they did not take and continue to not take the threat of pokies seriously. WA, I believe, has taken the pokies out of the, RS uh, out of the RSL and they've seen a huge benefit from doing that. It's not always about the money, and I think that's been the big concern, is that they lose the money, they lose the income if the pokies leave, but it's a, it's a short-term loss for a long-term gain that's definitely worth it. Rebecca, um, a case study there of, uh, of people getting lump sum payouts and mm -hmm. then just pouring all of the payouts mm -hmm. into poker. People with brain damage, as yeah. the questioner said, Absolutely. pouring the payouts into poker machines mm -hmm. in the RSL, yeah. their own club. It's, it's, it's preying on, on vulnerable people and, and thank you for your question. I, I might say the RSLs in, in my community, in, in Mayo, we don't have pokies, and yet RSL, our RSLs are thriving communities and we have younger veterans and older veterans and we nearly all of them have a museum um, with, within their RSL and they are welcoming places for the whole community. 
and I hope that Victoria moves to South Australia's model because we, we might not have glitzy RSLs, um, but they're wonderful places to be. Toby, uh, what do you think about this? I mean, you've defended, as you said earlier, a number of unpopular industries. How about the poker machine industry? Um, so, poker machines are um, insidious. They're sort of a stupidity tax. You put a dollar in, you get 90 cents out. You put 90 cents in, you get 80 cents out. You keep doing it till you lose your money. It's a bad thing. The, the interesting question here is, by doing something ghastly like promoting poker machines in RSLs, uh, are, you, are you able to deliver something good and what's the balance between them? I don't know the answer, but I was interested to hear Sammy say that, in fact, the change in... Uh, ha has been positive when they've been dropped. I, do, I know you don't mean uh, to be offensive when you say the stupidity tax, but, but there's a, uh, a victim-blaming element to that that's sure. been a mm. major part of the problem with pokies. We know, for example, that the way the games are designed, they prey on people's psychology, they prey on mm. hu human weaknesses. They do. And it's, uh, it's, it's more of an addiction issue than it is, you know, a, as you said, a stupidity tax. For, for, so, for Toby, some. what do you think? Should the RSL, being the kind of institution it is, representing veterans... Um, Listen to these accounts oh. and think again about what it is they're doing. Clearly they should. I mean, clearly the RSL should listen to veterans. I mean, that's its job. Um, and then they have to weigh up, is the money that we're delivering and who are we getting it from? Is the money we're delivering doing greater good than greater damage? And that's... that's I don't know the facts around that. It sounds like it's doing greater damage from what I'm hearing here. But, uh, um, now, uh, just remember this. If uh, you or anyone you know is experiencing difficulties, please call the number on your screen. Oh, well, that is all we have time for tonight. I didn't realise I was ending up there. Please thank <laughs> our panel. Sammy Shah, Jim Molan, Rebecca Sharkey, Linda Burney Thanks and everyone. Toby Ralph. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, indeed, we were at the end of the program. So, next week on Q&A, Boris Brexit and the Black Dog will be joined by Tony Blair's legendary spin doctor, Alistair Campbell, who's just released a documentary about his battle with depression. Former WA Premier Jeff Gallup, the pro-Brexit head of the Menzies Research Institute, Nick Cater, uh, businesswoman Kate Mills and political scientist Anne Tiernan from Queensland Griffith University. Until then, good night. <laughs>